All right, everybody, let's take a moment here to give credit where credit is due. If you haven't heard about Anchor before, you're hearing it from me now, all right? It's a creation app that allows you to record, edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. It will distribute your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It is free. What did I say? Yes, yes, I said it's free. You can make money from your podcast as well. So what are you waiting for? Go and download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Let's go. Oi, oi, yes, it's me. (laughs) It's your friendly pharmacist here for another episode. Yeah, c'est moi. It's help facts. What, what? Yeah, let's go. (laughs) I am delighted to bring you this killer episode. I mean, literally killer. I mean, we're going to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, we have heard a lot of different things about this pandemic, and we all have something to say about it. We're currently living through it. And most of us have been affected by it one way or another. Big question mark here is, how did it all start? I'm Blossom, pharmacist and public health enthusiast, bringing you the most up-to-date info on the COVID-19 pandemic. Without further ado, let's begin. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to try this time around just to give you a little bit of a, you know, preamble. I don't know. Um, Yeah, I'm going to try to not be funny because this one is close to home for a lot of people and it's still current. So I'm just going to give you a lowdown of what actually happened. That way you're aware how it started, where we're at, blah, blah, blah. So let me set the scene for you guys. January 1st, 2020, 12 a.m. The bells are ringing. The fireworks are filling up the skies. There's chanting, there's singing, and it can be heard all the way from outer space. We ring in the New Year's filled with joy and high expectations for what was to come. We celebrate not having a single clue what was coming. Now, all the way across the ocean in Wuhan, China, there was a mysterious pneumonia going around. The first case was identified on December 1st of 2019, when a man in his 70s started to exhibit symptoms. At the time, no one knew that this was going to turn into what we now know as the COVID-19 pandemic. People started to come down with fevers, like high fevers, cough, and none of the traditional treatments were working. Several labs attempted to sequence the genome of the virus that had been making people sick, One of these labs mistakenly identified the virus as SARS. Now, this report got in the hands of a local ophthalmologist, Dr. Li Wenliang, who was worried about a potential outbreak. He mentioned his finding to a group chat (laughs) with his colleagues to to warn them about a potential outbreak. And he advised to keep this information within the group. But as you know, (laughs) with group chats, there's always that one person that you can't trust with anything, and he should have known better. So obviously, his message went viral, and this brought the public security, which is a secret police force, down on him, making him sign a confession and agree to be quiet about what he found. Basically, they claimed that his behavior had severely disrupted social order. At the hospitals, officials were not allowed to talk to anyone, They weren't even allowed to wear a mask so as to avoid panic. Wuhan's local health commission instructed health officials to not release information of new cases to the public, but report them directly to them. Their orders leaked as well and spread all over the internet. People started to panic because after what happened with SARS, they were afraid that the government was hiding an outbreak from them again. They used the Chinese media to try and convince the general population that They had nothing to worry about, and basically, all of it was just rumors. China's National Health Commission released a statement on January 1st of 2020 saying that the viral pneumonia is under control and there is no clear evidence of human transmission. They also stated that they had investigated the virus and it has no relationship with SARS. 
it was very frustrating for healthcare providers in Wuhan because they were treating several severe cases of pneumonia. People were dying, but the government's assuring them that there's nothing to worry about. Talk about gaslighting. A week after Dr. Li Wen Lang, the ophthalmologist, had agreed to be quiet, he himself came down with the coronavirus and he died from it. Chinese scientists finally were able to map out the genome of the virus and found that it was indeed related to the SARS virus. After their discovery, China's National Health Commission sent secret orders to the lab, barring them from publishing their results without authorization. They wanted to, they basically wanted this problem to be solved as quickly and quietly as possible. But problems like this don't just disappear. I mean, it happened before with SARS. Not to mention, they were breaking international health regulations, which requires any country with an outbreak like this one to report it within 24 hours of discovery. While all of this was going on, Chinese New Year celebrations were unaware. This means that there was a lot of traveling going on across the country and across the world. Now, Professor Zhang Yongjin, I apologize for butchering the name, a renowned virologist from Shanghai, whose lab sequenced the genome of SARS-CoV-2 virus, finally released the results to a website called Virological, and this was tweeted all over on Twitter. Um, he did this after carefully considering the consequences of keeping it secret. He had obtained full genetic sequence of the virus by January 5th, but only released this information January 11th. And this was because he was prohibited from sharing this information by the Chinese authorities. So the release of this information, however, forced Beijing to come clean with the CDC and WHO. Finally, the rest of the world was aware of the situation and finally were able to act on it. On January 13th, there was German scientists publishing two kits for a test so that other countries could use it to check for cases. Meanwhile, in, Sh in Shanghai, Zhang's lab was temporarily shut down after the leak for quote-unquote rectification. To this day, the Chinese government still claim that it took time to study and understand the virus and that they wasted no time in releasing the sequence to WHO. On January 20th, about two months after the first case, the Chinese government finally confirmed human-to-human -human transmission of the disease. Wuhan was finally put on lockdown on the 23rd of January. And at this point, there were probably thousands of cases in Wuhan, but only 571 cases were reported in China as a whole. Cases obviously may have been suppressed. There's no saying, and I, you know, I don't know. But the bottom line is, at this point, it was already too late. It had spread to other countries. So by January 31st, WHO finally issued a global health emergency. At this point, cases began to pop up in several other countries. There was a death toll of 200 wor worldwide with over 9,800 cases. So it already spread. Okay, before I go any further, I should take some moment here to shed some light on the coronavirus. So the coronavirus is actually a large family of viruses that includes the cold virus, SARS, and SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 being the virus that causes COVID-19. So SARS-CoV-2, the name of the virus. COVID-19, the name of the infection that causes, that's caused by the virus, okay? Now, it's unclear where this virus originated, but there are stipulations that it may have crossed over to humans from bats. It can be transmitted through contact, air droplets, airborne, fomites, um, fecal, oral root, blood born, or mother to child, and also animal to human. And this is, you know, according to WHO, not me, not my, um, I didn't make this up. So people who are exposed to the virus may or may not exhibit symptoms. Individuals who do not show symptoms are called asymptomatic. Although asymptomatic, they are still able to spread the virus. Symptomatic individuals show symptoms such as fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, headache, muscle aches, etc. These symptoms typically will appear within 2 to 14 days after exposure to the virus. 
and people with severe cases um, will end up having to be put under mechanical ventilator, which basically just pumps some air into their lungs so that they can get some oxygen into their bloodstream. Um, technically, ventilators don't cure the infections, but they help support a person while they try to fight off the infection, giving them a better shot at survival. So now that you're fully educated on COVID-19, let's continue. <laughs> The United States. Now, the director of the CDC, Dr. Robert Redfield, was notified on New Year's Eve while he was on vacation with his family of the strange pneumonia in China. At the point, they were pretty confident that there was no evidence of human to human transmission, so there was no need for concern. But Redfield was concerned, so he went ahead and notified the Secretary of Health and Human Services named Alex Azar, and the National Security Council at the White House. That's one part of it. But also, in the White House, the president began to receive daily briefings containing warnings of the outbreak and potential harm that it may cause. Apparently, he may or may have not <laughs> read any of these briefings, so maybe he had no idea what was going on. It is unclear, which was the case. His excuse, however, is that he was distracted with his impeachment. <laughs> the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Azar, tried to tell the president what he had heard, but he couldn't get a meeting until January, 10, um, January 18th. However, when he did get his meeting, he was not able to convey the gravity of the situation to the president. Apparently, he just reassured the president that he had nothing to worry about. Basically, they had it under control. By January 26, even Dr. Anthony... Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease official, downplayed the dangers of the outbreak. On January 29th, the White House economic advisor, Peter Navarro, sent the president a lengthy memo warning that there was a risk of massive loss of life, and he heard, urged them to halt the flights from China. The next day, Secretary Azar had a second call with the president. This time, he was more, more concerned. He warned the president that the coronavirus might become something serious. It might become a pandemic, basically. And then the president responded by restricting some flight from China, but not all. And millions of people at this time already left Wuhan, flying out to the rest of the world. So it probably wouldn't have made a difference at this point. As a matter of fact, an est estimated 380,000 people entered the U.S. from China prior to his decision. Not to mention, Americans were exempt and flights from Europe were not restricted for another six weeks. The first U.S. case, patient one. He was found in Seattle, Washington, and he was a 35-year-old male who started to show symptoms a day after returning from Wuhan, China. He went to a walk-in clinic, and based on his symptoms, travel history, they responded based on their training for when new cases erupted in the area. He was taken to the hospital in a seed pod, sealed type pod ambulance. This pod was designed to prevent any exposures or spread of the disease. He ended up developing pneumonia while in the hospital, but lucky for him, he was in the best hands, and it was the best time, to be honest, because the hospitals were not crowded at the moment. Um, so he survived the infection, but not long after, new cases started to show up in other parts of Washington. Then started to get out of control. Suspected COVID-19 cases started to show up mid-February in New York City as well, and we all know how that went. At this time, the president was still assuring everyone everything is under control and that it would just disappear once the weather ones are... <laughs> I'm so bad at the Trump accent, but bear with me. With no assistance from the federal government, the states were basically on their own. They had to use their own resources and act fast. Seattle acted pretty quickly. They pushed for a statewide shutdown. And I've got to say, overall... This response fell short of what was expected from the United States. Now let's go all the way across the world to Seoul, South Korea, where the response was completely different. On January 27th, after just four cases were reported in South Korea, the local CDC officials called an emergency meeting involving 20 private companies. The goal was to encourage the companies to develop COVID-19 diagnostic test kits. 
Just three days after the meeting, four companies had developed COVID-19 diagnostic tests, one of which was approved not long after. By February 7, 46 labs across the country began testing people for COVID-19. Korea, yeah, they recognized the danger that this pandemic presented due to prior experience with MERS and SARS, just saying, and they acted promptly. They began to monitor cases through contact tracing, isolating, quarantining potential exposures. They had personnel wiping down public spaces and contact points, providing and processing drive through testing. It was pretty impressive how seriously they took it. They did a much better job managing the outbreak in its early stages than most other countries did. By mid-January, the U.S. CDC began developing its own diagnostic test. But by the end of the first week in February, they had discovered contamination in a CDC lab in Atlanta where the first batch of the test kits were being developed. Basically, the test kits were screwed and they were not working. So this set back the production of testing kits for another few weeks. Now, this is a part of the pandemic that really, really gets on my nerves. You know, I will say that I do not completely judge how the United States acted during the pandemic because all the other countries, most of the other countries actually did the same thing, you know, but this is where they really messed up. And I will tell you why this is what happened. So after, you know, the setback with the production of the testing kits happened, there were diagnostic kits that were already developed by German scientists, and these were available. WHO offered this to, U to the U.S., but this is what the U.S. officials said. They said, we need to find an American solution. Oh, this annoys me so much. There was a rise in COVID-19 cases, probably more than we were aware of at the time because there were no testing kits, but we wanted to use the American solution what American solution? There was no American solution. There was nothing. Let me tell you what the American solution was. Potential COVID-19 cases were denied testing because there, there was a shortage of testing kits, right? To get tested, the health officials had to get approval from their local public health authority. And then they had to coordinate with the CDC to get approval for testing. Tests were only available to people who had been to mainland China or confirmed contacts. And we all know that the cases that they already spread by then. There are people coming down with COVID that had no, no flights, no, no recent travels out of the country, and probably didn't know of any contacts of people who had traveled out of the country. But then people were still coming down sick with potentially COVID. They couldn't get tested because of limited testing kits. They didn't meet the criteria for testing. So what did they do? They went about their day spreading the virus to whoever cared enough to stop by and say hi. Not to mention, we were completely unaware at this time that there was an asymptomatic spread of the virus. Whew. So let, let me just calm down, calm down here, take a breather. Okay. So the U.S. finally declared a public health emergency on February 3rd. And on February 29th, the first COVID-19 death was reported in America near Seattle. By the end of the first week in March, there were 337 cases of covid and 17 deaths in the U.S. And these numbers are based on the people that actually got tested. So we don't know. There were lots of other people who probably had the virus and didn't get tested. So there was still a shortage. So we don't know. And by March 6th, the president says, anybody right now and yesterday, anybody that needs a test gets a test. They're here. They have the test. And the tests are beautiful. <gasps> Flat out lied. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Forgive my Trump accent. By March 11th, there were 1,300 cases in the U.S. and 36 deaths. WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic. It was then that President Trump declared COVID-19 a national emergency. Then he recommended a nationwide shutdown, expanding the travel ban across European countries. At this point, more than 100 million people around the world had been affected by COVID and more than 2.5 million have died from it. Sorry, a little too late. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's go to Italy. Now, what happened in Italy? There was a soccer match on February 19 in Milan, Italy. We all know how soccer games go. There's huge crowds, 
no personal bubbles. There's hugging, there's screaming, and there's kissing each other on the cheeks. I don't know why they do that, but they do when they're happy. No personal space whatsoever. No doubt, this obviously potentiated the spread of the virus in Italy. And like most countries, Italy initially did not see the outbreak in China as a threat. The government did not order a nationwide lockdown until like March 9th when they began to see the surge in cases. <laughs> and you know, in the words of one of the Italian mayors, quote unquote, do you all want us to get ill? You are irresponsible idiots, colossal idiots. <laughs> hospitals became overcrowded with sick patients. People were dying in hospitals, outside hospitals. There was not enough room for new patients. They were so overwhelmed that there were not enough beds or ventilators. Doctors had to choose to treat the younger over the older people because they thought they had a much better chance of survival. I mean, just imagine this, this sucks, having to decide, make the decision between life or death for your patient because you have no choice. I just cannot imagine how they're doing mental, mental health wise, that's awful. The severity of the situation finally caught the attention of other countries who then began to go on lockdown. By March 27th, they reached a record number of 921 deaths in 24 hours. Whew, that's just insane. That's crazy. Now, I think the virus really unmasked a lot of inadequacies in our healthcare system, especially in the United States. Um, it showed how unprepared the country was for a situation like this. There was lack of cooperation, communication across countries and between government officials was just awful. Media coverage was flawed. Healthcare issues were politicized, not to mention the massive inequity in the healthcare system. I remember reading the JAMA article last year that ranked the United States as number one out of 195 countries to be best prepared for a pandemic. Now this, this ranking was based on the following factors, one of them being the prevention of the emergence release or spread of pathogens. Two, early detection and reporting of epidemics of potential international concern. Three, rapid response to and mitigation of the spread of an epidemic. Four, sufficient and robust health system to treat affected patients and protect health workers. Five, commitments to improve national capacity, financing plans to address gaps and adhere to global norms. And six, Overall risk, environment, country vulnerability to biological threats. Now, all of these were a complete failure. I mean, we all know it was a complete failure. And you know what? This article, it later <laughs> revised its statement saying that their calculations did not account for the major gaps in federal leadership that resulted in the failure to mobilize the country's substantial capacity, not to mention poor confidence in the government. So basically saying we had the like we had the resources but we just didn't know when and how to use it. And obviously people didn't trust the government, which I mean very evident. Now this revolt obviously resulted in the refusal to follow state mandates and disease control measures. As of September of 2020, the US accounted for less than 5% of the world's population, but more than 25% of total COVID-19 cases per, cases that were reported across the globe. Now, you know, I feel like I've spent a lot of time in this episode shitting on several countries, but let's shift a little bit to a more positive aspect of this pandemic. You know, I think I need to balance things out a little bit. So let's talk about New Zealand. New Zealand. I know most of y'all are probably wondering what happened. You know, I was too, so I had to look it up and I thought it probably would be great to add it to the episode. So what did New Zealand do differently? Yes, see. Now, New Zealand, they ranked first place, in my opinion, when it comes to COVID-19 response. And this was also, according to Global Response Index, they were actually selected as the first in their response. Now, the reason why New Zealand did so well is because they reacted to the pandemic as soon as it was declared a public health emergency by WHO in January. Now, New Zealand, they began implementing their pandemic influenza plan as early as February, which included preparing hospitals for an influx of patients. They added some border control policies to delay the pandemic's arrival. And citizens who were returning from other countries were required to quarantine for 14 days at a designated location. 
The government also enforced a lockdown for the whole country. This was on March 26, and they designated uh, it as a alert level four. So obviously the lockdown was lifted slowly as expected through the months. By early May, the last known COVID-19 case was identified in the community and the person was placed in isolation. This marked the end of identified community spreads last year. And this was June 8th. June 8th. New Zealand released its restrictions because at this point the country was free of the virus. 103 days after the first case was identified. As of today, New Zealand has reported a total of 2,601 cases with only 26 deaths. I mean, I think it definitely helped that New Zealand is an isolated island far from the rest of the world, therefore making it difficult for people to cross the borders unnoticed. However, I do think that a huge part of their success is the prompt response and strict guidelines that were followed. And there's probably more trust in the government and maybe better communication. But the point is, New Zealand is the perfect image of what we should have done to prevent the death of thousands. The plain truth is, a lot of people died simply because we were unprepared. We can go on and on blaming China for what happened, but they're not the only ones at fault. I agree, there was a lot of deception at the beginning, but this is not the first pandemic that we've ever had. The signs were there and they were crystal clear. We chose to ignore it. Our response once again was, quote unquote, not our problem, until it became our problem. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, it does not serve any purpose to keep focusing on the mistakes that were made. At this moment, yes, the main priority should be to move past this. But it would be insane to completely ignore our past mistakes. We need to go back, we need to look at it, and we need to figure out what went wrong so that we never let this happen ever happen again. Like I said on my last episode, history does not lie. This has happened before, it's happening right now, and it will happen again. Now, what are we going to do to be better prepared next time? That's the most important question, and that's my two cents. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I had so much fun putting it together, and as usual, I've run out of things to say, so I'm going to let you guys go. Like I say on every single episode, subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss another episode. Also, leave a positive review and drop a comment. Let me know how you feel about this episode and what you would like to hear about in future episodes. You can find more information on my Instagram account at healthfacts, facts spelled with a C-X at the end, or find my blog, www.healthfacts.com, same spelling. Send a message or an email of topics that you're interested in hearing more about. Again, thank you guys for listening and I will see you next Wednesday. All right, everybody, let's take a moment here to give credit where credit is due. If you haven't heard about Anchor before,